Well, good evening, everyone. I just gave it a few minutes to make sure that it was going to stay connected. Last week, we had a lot of breaks in our broadcast, and by the Lord's grace, I've been testing it for the last few hours, going online, even doing a little minute and a half test video. I don't see any problems, but the Lord's will be done. If we have to stress through it, we will. And I see Brother David and Scott uh, online there. Glad to have you with us. And we already have a question from uh, Brother David, uh, David Wayne Crisp. I'll go ahead and uh, why don't I start in with that one as soon as I get through, uh, we get started. We'll go there. I've got a lot of questions today. Some of them I've chosen. I'm going to show them to us. Uh, some of them I've chosen to do a particular podcast this week, uh, one particularly on covenant theology. And I may actually also come to um, dealing with uh, about experience exposing ministries and or slash pastor teachers, which I'll say for the latter part of our show. But these are important things because not only do some of you ask them, but that question specifically was uh, asked on a forum uh, by a friend, and it's something that that he and and others are embroiled in right now, and they're really seeking um, the answer to. And I believe because of the way that we've had to deal with these things in the last few years, um, I believe the scripture speaks to that very clearly. So we're going to spend some time there. And if we don't get time to it today, we'll do a podcast on it this week, uh, maybe even a live vidcast from here. All righty here. Okay. But let's get started. First question of the night, Brother David says, What role does God's word play in how you set the direction of your life? Well, we have the, you know, the scripture that teaches us um, very clearly that if we... You know, seek after the Lord. He'll give us the desires of our heart. We should say, as James teaches, you know, we're, don't say we're just going to go do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do this. Uh, say if the Lord wills, etc. And so, the the Word of God as a believer is the is the light to our to our life. Is the light to our plans. It is the filter through which all things sift. And I think that when it comes to knowing and understanding the will of the Lord, the Word of God is clearly the only way that that takes place. Uh, some of those areas are clear. For example, David, we have uh, the an- you know the answer to the questions of how we should treat people, of you know what salvation is, what saving faith looks like, um, how we should relate to each other in the context uh, context of conflict or discipline. Um, you know, how we should deal in our business dealings. So as a rule of life, the Word of God in its totality, not just, you know, what some people talk about the law and the Decalogue and things like that, but the Word of God in its totality uh, is sufficient for us to to find direction. But I think maybe you're talking more specifically about how, you know, where what is it that God wants us to do? Uh, Is there anything in particular that He's calling us to? And I would say that there are always things that are um, called for us to do in the sense that every believer has to do them. For example, we are always supposed to be learning. We are always supposed to be growing. We are always supposed to be sharing. We are always supposed to be serving one another. We're supposed to be investing in the lives of other people in the context of the Scripture and teaching them. Um, we're, we're to worship and to learn. And, and so all of these things take place in our lives. And as we do them, then I believe God does, just as He did me, puts me in a position to where I'm working with so many different people, I'm talking and and teaching, and my heart just beats for the teaching of the church and for the sheep to have a a, a true oversight of intimacy and concern and care, uh, specifically spiritually and then also practically as the spiritual element uh, feeds into that uh, because we can't escape our spiritual lives as regenerated people. And... So with the Word of God, we know that, let's just say it's something simple uh, or something not so simple, like should I take this job? Should I move to this location? Well, we know that if we take a job or move to a location, the most important aspect of those things is do we have a fellowship of believers that we can be in partnership with and be in intimacy with? Are we going to be able, are we going to suffer in our spiritual growth uh, for our financial growth or for our economic growth, maybe the same thing, uh, or for our uh, career growth? Uh, advancement or et cetera for a relationship. And we shouldn't do that. So God's word shows us that these things should be paramount um, 
before all other things. You know, seek first the glory of uh, you know the kingdom of heaven, and uh, that's a little bit of a pretext in the use of that. But but you get the point. Do all things for the glory of God. But wherever God may put us, we still have those same responsibilities. Uh, but let's say we you know we have a couple of jobs before us. We have a couple of cars that we want to purchase. We don't know which one. Well, the Bible tells us to pray for wisdom. So in that, then we know that the Word of God then has a role in helping us that we are going to stand firm, not fickly, uh, if I can use that as an adverb, uh, if, you know, not in a fickle way, uh, but we stand firm in that which we feel that God would be pleased with and honored to have us accomplish. It's not very cut and dry, and I think that might be the, the, the point of your question. It's not that easy to discern, you know, a lot of details because God doesn't necessarily give us a lot of details. We, As we go through life, God establishes the circumstances that put us where we are, and we then have the ability to seek out His wisdom, and that is found in the Word of God. And let's just say in the midst of it all, we make terrible choices, and we make terrible decisions, and everything that we put our hands on just falls apart, and we never feel like we've ever found our, quote, place in life. And when we do that, uh, a lot of people come and say, well, what's the Lord trying to teach me? The Lord's not trying to teach us anything in that. It's not like He says, well, you made all the wrong dumb choices, so you just keep flipping around like a fish out of water until you get it right, and then you'll swim away. No, even in the midst of those, and I'm not saying that God doesn't teach us through those things. He most certainly does. Um, I'm just saying that when we make mistakes, it's not because we're not suffering because we haven't figured God out. But even in the midst of those places where we feel like fish out of water and we're never getting it right, the Word of God is our peace. The Word of God is where we come to find solace in the midst of much confusion. The Word of God is our intimacy with the Lord Jesus, the fullness of the glory of God the Father. So the Word of God is so important for the life of the believer that I think that we should be more willing to skip meals several times a week to be in Scripture than we than we would be not to. Um, and I'm not talking about the discipline of fasting. I'm just saying in a, in a practical way, it'd be good for us to skip meals <laughs> if we don't have time to read the Bible because in the Word of God, God will show us, His Holy Spirit will give us wisdom, peace, and confidence. And even when those things don't come together the way we think they should, we then have understanding that our peace and joy comes from the Lord. And if you have a follow-up on that, Brother David, I'd be glad to to um, give some more direction on that. Uh, Gabriel, you have a question here. Can you explain the problem with Reformed theology? Brother, that's a mixed bag of tricks. I probably can't answer this in an hour and a half uh, because there's a lot there with that idea of problem with Reformed theology uh, because there's not a problem with Reformed theology. There's a problem with the interpretation, the application, and the use of Reformed theology. Uh, The same thing, I think you might have asked a question a minute ago, um, but I can't see it. Um, the doctrines of grace and creeds and confessions. I can I can talk to that for a second, but when it comes to um, the idea of or the label of being reformed, it's like the label of being a Calvinist or being a Presbyterian or being a Baptist. A lot of people have taken these labels on Gabriel, but they've not yet understood the full implications of what they are or what they mean. And so, therefore, they'll say, well, I'm Baptist, or I'm Reformed, or I'm, I believe in covenant theology, or I believe in federalism, or, or whatever it might be, and they've never really studied what that looks like from an academic point of view. So, they just go around with the labels, and somebody else could have a different viewpoint. So, semantically, these things are extremely frustrating. And when we think, what is the problem with Reformed theology? Well, the very nature of any type of theology, any specific label of theology, we've put the label over the authority of Scripture. And when we come to recognize that there is a congruence with what um, a, a, a Reformer might have written, with what the Word of God states, then we say, hey, you know what, that's good, that's good stuff. Um, but we can't say that the whole of Reformed doctrine is all accurate, because it's not. And we have to learn to uh, equip ourselves in that way, and that's why the teaching of the Word of God is so important for the church, because without it, we would not have a... Um, we would not have a, a foothold. We would just be ditto heads regurgitating the, the doctrinal positions without any substance. 
of our Reformed brothers and sisters of yesterday. And so um, I personally feel that there's a lot of people who claim the name Reformed or Calvinist, etc., who, who have no idea uh, what they mean and what they think um, they, they believe. And quite honestly, when we see people talk about sovereign grace, uh, that, same, that same label, you know, what does it mean? Well, a lot of people can't explain it, and uh, therefore they don't really know what they believe. They just like the label. I think that the resurgence of Reformed doctrine uh, over the last 15 years uh, or so has just been something that's been sort of favorable in um, younger circles, and I think it's going to really start to show a divide, and I'm just taking a guesstimate off the top of my head, six or seven different categories of people who <laughs> actually stand in positions that are contradictory to one another, but yet they all stand and have the same label. But if you have any specific questions on those, please surely give me a um, give me a uh, um, give me a question on that. I'd be glad to ask it. Uh, let's see. All right, here's a, Paul's got a, a good question here. Um, I think a big problem in Reformed thinking is now we're in the New Covenant. What do we do with God's Ten Commandments? I think it's more of a comment uh, in the state of a question. Paul, you're absolutely right. Uh, the Ten Commandments are to do exactly what they did with Israel on Mount Sinai. They're to make us guilty and to show us that there is no hope outside of Christ. So the impeccability of Christ, Jesus Christ, is displayed. His righteousness is displayed. His essence is displayed. His, uh, his beauty and His glory and His majesty is displayed in the law and the law is good and the law is awesome and the law is something we should love but we should love it in its proper place which is that it does kill us every moment that we make provision in the flesh to try to establish it in our established righteousness through the law especially the Decalogue we are dead um, and we will receive the wage of death. But even as believers, we sometimes like to stick our hand. I said this morning we want Jesus to shackle our feet to the, to the rock, but then we want to put our hand on Moses. Beloved, the gospel prohibits that. It establishes the covenant that Christ is the fulfillment of His law. And yes, it's a good place for us to look and understand that it's a good rule of life. Don't lie to your neighbor. Love the Lord. All of these things. But Jesus gives a summary of those things for the New Testament church when He says to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so that is the real thrust of New Testament living. Um, and it's not a it's not an obedience and adherence to the law. It's a fruitfulness that comes out of an affection for Christ, where we strive to these things and never perfect and never never effectual and they never stand in front of God and he goes wow that's awesome well done you loved what you loved well it doesn't work like that but we uh we do know that there are many people who purvey a gospel that is false because it is adding to the gospel of grace so therefore it would be called legalism and that's that's the biggest problem that we have sometimes with the with the 10 commandments <clears throat> Uh, yeah, Andrew, I like this thing. I, I was on national radio one time years ago with this. Um, and it is a proof text sometimes for people to go out and buy weapons. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's one of these, one of these real funny, um, situations where we have to, we have to be very careful not to subject Jesus to our cult our current culture. We live in a, we live in a culture in the United States and I, I am a, I'm a, I, I, let me put it this way. I enjoy firearms. I'm an avid collector. Um, I'm actually an FFL. Um, there's my firearms record book right here. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a licensed dealer uh, for firearms. I do enjoy shooting. My children and my family enjoy shooting. Um, and we also do carry for self-defense, personal defense reasons. And uh, there was a time that I liked to hunt. So firearms have always been part of our lives. But we live in a culture now where firearms, were we just sort of like got a gun culture. And it's really weird um, because a lot of people who I know who are just really pro-gun, they don't even know how to use them. And they have a false sense of security when it comes to what kind of defense and protection that a firearm will give. Uh, I carry a firearm on my person. I have a firearm and a quick draw on my desk. Um, and if someone wanted to come up to my window here or come busting in my front door and shoot me or hurt me, they would do that before I would have opportunity to respond. However, just like this morning, a little bit after 4.20, um, I, uh, I was up and I heard this ruckus outside and the dogs were barking and everything was going crazy out there. So I peek outside and I see a fight 
happening in the middle of the street, a verbal altercation with a little bit of a physical altercation. I didn't stay out there long enough to find out. I came back in and called the police, and the police came and, and dispersed it post-haste. But, you know, if that had something that I had to engage, I would be, I would be better equipped uh, with a firearm. And so I think that that's what Jesus is trying to say. Don't, don't catch yourself with your, as uh, my grandma used to say, don't get caught with your pants down. Um, you know, and I don't know if that means you're in a restroom and you just, or whatever. But the point is, don't be, um, don't find yourself unprepared when you need it. So when it comes to firearms, I think we have a right under the law to own them, but I think we need to be responsible for them. And uh, I honestly have a big concern with a lot of people who aren't necessarily equipped to have them. And I don't want, I don't think we should use Jesus. Um, we should use Jesus text here to, to warrant um, using force and buying weapons. Uh, I would use force to protect the lives of others. Um, I have had many opportunities through the years where I've had guns drawn on me. I've had knives poked at me. I've had people hit me and push me. Uh, I am trained in, in defense systems and martial systems and different types of fighting arts, um, but I've never really had to hurt anybody because I've been trained to get away from these things and deal with these things in a nonviolent way. Um, I have had to draw a firearm one time, but by the Lord's grace, the person subdued. He said, "Okay, I'm I'm done. I won't I won't continue in this in this action." So the Lord's been gracious to us. We've never had to use force, um, and I and I have a real problem with the idea of having to take a life. You know what it would mean for someone. At the same time, I have a God who is greater, so I don't think it's wrong to have a sword. I don't think it's wrong to have firearms. I think it's wrong to live in a culture where we believe that they give us a sense of security that the Lord cannot operate apart from. So it's like uh, it's like wise men have always told me, if I have the United States a Marine standing around my house and God wants one little boy with a sling and a rock to come in here and kill me, it's going to happen. And if God doesn't want me to be hurt, then I can have one little boy with a sling and a rock on the inside of my house and the entire United States Marine Corps on the outside, and nobody can touch me. It depends on what God's will is, but I'm going to be prepared either way. Uh, just like I brush my teeth and I lock my doors and I wear my seatbelt and I carry a, a daily knife uh, in case I want to open a box or stab a box that tries to attack me at the post office. But yeah, these are these are interesting, interesting things. Um Let's see. This next question. What are antinomianism and legalism, and why is it not a contradiction to be neither of these? Um, this, this could take a long time, so I'm going to give you the short and skinny on it and possibly do some podcast on these um, in part. Antinomianism. Uh, first, let me say what legalism is. Legalism is basically adding anything whatsoever to the finished work of Jesus Christ. So adding to the gospel, for example, you know, you want to be saved, but you got to be baptized. It's legalism. Uh, you want to have eternal life. You can believe in Jesus Christ, but you need to be circumcised, the Galatia, uh, and, and, and so on and so on and so on and so on. Or if you are a believer, then these things will be true in your life. Oh, they're not, then you're not truly a believer. That is a type of legalism. Antinomianism is to exercise a frivolous Oh gosh, let me let me put this in the right let me put this in the right way that I don't understate what this really is um, and become an antinomian in my definition of antinomianism. Um, usually, antinomianism is just to contradict legalism, and in itself, it becomes legalism because it establishes an there and one's own law by saying there is no law. And what it does is it's either an in, setting aside of God's law, and that means the Word of God or the commands of God, period, and fully in the name of grace. Now, Paul answers this in Romans 6 and 7 and 8. He begins to have this conversation. He says, so grace, 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 grace. Uh, it's all of God. It's all of grace. No man is justified by the works of the law. However, uh, because that's true, should we just continue to sin so that grace may abound? He says it's an absolute absurdity. He said, absolutely not. That's absurd. It's, I mean, if we were to use it in vernacular, that's just dumb. Uh, why would we do that? Why would we continue to strive to be 
uh, sinful in everything we do just because God is gracious. So that's what an antinomian would be in a true sense. Someone could just say, let me just enjoy the flesh. Uh, well, let me tell you what I like about my flesh. Nothing. I can't wait to the day I'm glorified. I cannot wait to the day that I don't have to fight the battle over temptation and that I will never sin again. Uh, I love God, and I love my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and I love His Word, and I love His law, and one day I will be perfect in the image of that law because I will be made in the image of my Savior. But until then, we are going to struggle. So why is it not a contradiction to be neither of these? Because they're... <laughs> The, the Scripture doesn't teach either of these as valid. The Scripture teaches that there is grace, and then the Scripture that salvation is all of God, all of grace, and then the Scripture see, um, teaches uh, that to those who are redeemed by the grace of God, the Scripture teaches some things that they should understand about how they should relate to one another, how we should think, how we should speak, how we should act. First John, this is a good way of summing this question up. Why is it not a contradiction? He says, These things are written for you, beloved little children, that you may not sin. But if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So there is no sin that leads to death for the elect of God. There is no sin that we can commit in our flesh that would cause us to be cast away by Jesus Christ as believers because He has propitiated for us. The wrath of God is satisfied on our behalf and the righteous commandments and the and the the, the, the requirements of God's righteous commandments are met in Jesus Christ. And so whether we do or whether we don't, it doesn't change our standing. And if we do practice, uh, that's a silly word, if we do commit a sin, we are not condemned, for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And when we don't commit a sin, we're not more loved. And so that's why it's not a contradiction to be neither of these. And the brother who asked his questions, I don't think he's on right now, but I'm sure he'll have some follow-ups on on that in that way. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the next question is uh, this. We've got a lot of questions tonight. How do we handle the idea of the regular assembly? I have to be honest, I don't understand what this is asking. And so I would ask the person who asked this, I think it came from last week, if you ask this question, could you please reiterate it and help me understand exactly what you're, what you're asking there? What, what are we supposed to be handling the idea of regular assembly? Now, let me take a shot at it. I think that maybe you might be asking, you know, what are we supposed to do? How do we deal with people who might say we're supposed to be in fellowship every week? We don't say that. The Bible says that. The Bible actually gives us the the teaching of the apostles and tells us that everything that 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 Paul writes, everything that Peter writes, everything that John writes, everything that you know uh, uh, that, that's written in the New Testament, it's written so that we can live life together. And we're supposed to do these things in relationship to one another. So there is a there is a continual understanding and then also a continual teaching and exhortation and admonishment, that's like a warning, do these things in the context of a warning, that we should be together. So we handle that because we handle it that way because we believe that scripture shows it. And also everything that the apostles teach is given to the assembly of the saints. So that is that is something that that uh, we take very, uh, we take to heart in that way. How do we tell if something is or isn't a sin? A young teenager asked this question of me this week, a 16 year old, and um, uh, let me let me answer it this way: We can tell that something is a sin uh, if it's listed in the law of God as something we should not do. We can tell that something is a sin if we see Jesus teaching it as a commandment, against it as a commandment. Um, and so let's do the positive and the negative. We can see what we should do and shouldn't do. If we don't do what we should do, it's a sin. If we do what we shouldn't do, it's a sin, and so on. We can see it in the written law and the written scripture. <clears throat> we can see it in the Ten Commandments. We can see it in the teaching of Jesus. We can see it in the commandments of the apostles. Uh, we can see it in the, uh, and then also in the conscience. There are some things that are not in themselves sinful. For example, drinking alcohol, consuming alcohol is not sinful. But it could be sinful for some people, but it's not sinful for all people. If your conscience bears witness that you should not imbibe, then don't do it. If you do, it would be a sin. Um, if your conscience bears witness that you shouldn't celebrate Christmas, uh, put up a tree, then don't do it. But if someone else puts up a tree, it's not a sin. These are liberties and these are matters of conscience. And so that is some of those things that 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 
it's difficult to discern, and that's another reason why we should be in the assembly, because there is there is wisdom in the multitude of counsel. And so as we come together as the body, just as even like what we do on these Q&As, y'all are asking me questions. But, you know, if you don't have somebody to walk through these things with you or to interact, and Andrew, I agree, let's get together a little bit um, this week if you have time. Um, you know, th- there are things that we can learn and glean from one another uh, and then also work out. You know, d- am I really evil because, I, you know, I, I eat Milkshakes, some people would say. Well, you're, you're treating your body as a, as, as a trash can rather than the Holy Spirit's temple, the temple of God. Uh, and I'm not making light of that. That's an issue of conscience for some people. And so it's wrong of that they feel, they feel prohibited from eating things that aren't very, very healthy. When some guys, you know, they're out there beating the pavement and doing evangelism, and they need to pick me up, and a good chocolate shake from McDonald's is a good thing to give them. And we can't look at them and say, well, they're sinful, just like they can't look at us and say, well, we're sinful. It's a matter of conscience. So that's how we know what is and is not a sin. And when we begin to say that something is wrong that's not wrong, we have added a law and a burden, an undue burden on the people of God, and that is legalism. We have added, that's another type of legalism. We don't add. It's not a sin to wear shorts. It's not a sin to not to wear pants as a woman. It's not a sin. It may be an issue of conscience for you or for someone else, but it's not a sin. There also may be things that the a congregation may come to believe. For example, I have friends who 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 like to wear some type of hair cover, uh, a head cover for their for their daughters and for their wives and uh, they agree upon this, and the congregation agrees upon this, but they don't look down on others who don't, but it's what they do. And if you go to that church and want to join that church, they will say, hey, part of the things that we like to do is do this. And you can either agree and join the church, or you can disagree and not join the church. Now, you know, there are ways to fight about that, but all in the end, it's one of those things that that congregation has decided, just like some congregations decide not to have musical instruments. Some congregations decide to have, you know, a 12-piece drum a trap set. Um, I, we don't go there. We've got a keyboard that we only use the piano sound, and we have a guitar that's very rarely played, if ever. Um, and that's about it. But, you know, if we got together on Friday night, I'd grab that Barry sax over there or one of these saxophones over here, and we could have a really good jam session. But when it comes to the assembly, I just have a conscience that wants to be sensitive to the consciences of others. So that's how we tell if something is written a sin, and that's not necessarily a, a contextual answer, but it's a holistic answer. So if any of you have things to add to that, what are some other ways that the Lord has given you a conviction about something that was a sin? Maybe it was just something that did not honor the Lord, or maybe whatever. Just uh, love to put it in the comments if you have that option. Uh, let's see. What do we have here? I think this is the one that I just said. Um, okay, can you speak to the anti-Calvinist claim that God is the author of evil? Now, what this means is, now there are a lot of people who say, well, God is the author of evil. Uh, how can there be a God who is all benevolent and all powerful, yet he sees the evil in the world and he does nothing about it? And in a quick answer, uh, well, here's the point. A lot of people who are anti-Calvinist um, say that the Calvinist God, and I, oh my goodness, I could talk on that for days, just that, just that statement. Um, they that basically say the God of the Bible that is understood as one that is Calvinistic uh, in theological leanings is the author of evil. Uh, what does it mean to be the author? And and that's where we really have to 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 come. I believe <laughs> it's not that I believe it's that I utilize a Socratic method of engagement with anybody who comes from a negative position to refute something. Um, what does that look like? If someone says to me, well, your God is the author of evil, how do you answer that? I would ask them, what do you mean um, when you say the author of evil? What do you mean by that? And they'll come to me, well, God made people sin, and God made the devil fall, and God made Eve eat that she had no choice in the matter and all that. And that's just outside the narrative of Scripture. But the Scripture does say that God ordained and purposed, therefore these things would come to pass. So if God is the author of evil because He call, because He actually is the caused, cause of the, the, the fall of man, then yes, God is the cause of the fall. But God is the cause of the fall in righteousness. He purposed the evil for the sake of His 
own good and the work that he does in redemption. And moreover, like Paul says in Romans 4 and 5, somewhere in there, that God is patient with those who are evil. He's patient with the reprobate. He's patient with vessels of wrath that his righteousness might be fulfilled in their destruction. We can't grasp this because we have such a myopic black and white view of, you know, evil exists because of the lack of goodness. No, evil exists because created beings, number one, it was purposed, and number two, that we are always going to succumb as human beings to temptation. Adam, though he was sinless, was not immutable, and he was not impeccable. He was not righteous nor perfect. He was just sinless, and he was going to fall. He was going to fall because given the nature of who we are, that's what happens. Uh, God purposed it. And people that can't get behind that can't get behind the reality that at the last table, at the last supper, the Lord's table there that we see in the gospel accounts, that Judas Iscariot was ordained by God before the foundation of the world to be the instrument through which Jesus Christ would be arrested by the Pharisees in the, in the, in the temple. Um, uh, uh, goodness, I can't even think. The, the, the temple uh, soldiers, and he would go and be tried and be found innocent and then crucified anyway for the redemption of his people that he might save his people from their sins. And so God purposed the sin of selling out Jesus and the sin of murdering Jesus, listen to this, for the sake of his own righteousness so that he could forgive James Tippins for the guilt of his own sin in the finished work of Jesus Christ. I'm justified. This is difficult. When we move outside the pages of Scripture, we move to what I like to call, I don't think I've coined the phrase, but I don't hear anybody else using it, theological philosophy. And we get into a philosophical discussion about evil and author and all this stuff. And so when I have people ask me this question or posit this, this assumption or this assertion, I just make them, I make them flesh it out. And I don't answer anything until they answer my questions first. And I don't you know, we don't call fallacies fallacies. We don't. We recognize them and we just respond accordingly. Calling someone out on a fallacy is not winning that argument. It's actually buffoonery. And so, I'd like to encourage you all who do that to stop doing that. So, uh, it's like saying, "Yeah, and you're ugly, and your mama." Uh, so let's just uh, <laughs> let's let that go there. Um, that's a tough question to really get into without going into a lot of different things. Um, does the Bible say that it's wrong to proclaim someone to be lost? Uh, goodness gracious. No, um, and yes, it's wrong to pass judgment on a person's heart based on what we can observe and what we can understand and comprehend. However, Scripture in itself, so God proclaims those to be unregenerate who what? Who deny the gospel of grace. Those who deny Jesus Christ as the effectual person of righteousness and person of propitiation and justification, if, if the work in the person of Jesus Christ is denied, Scripture is very clear. The truth is not in them. They are not of God because they do not receive the Word of God. So we, we can say, okay, this person is um, unregenerate because they reject the truth of the gospel of grace. And I emphasize gospel of grace to distinguish the gospel of grace, the true gospel from the gospel of man, the gospel of legalism, the gospel of, you know, baptismal regeneration, and so forth and so forth, because we use the term as a statement rather than of uh, what it was intended, the evangel being good news of the redemption of God's people through the person of Jesus Christ. So it's not wrong to proclaim someone to be lost. But I think the better way of saying is that, that because of what you say and because of what God has said in the judgment of His Word, you've rejected the gospel of grace. And because of that, the wrath of God remains on you. Um, so that is, And that's always something that should only be done to that person's face. You don't make proclamations of who is lost and who's not lost and who's saved and who's not saved in a public venue, just like a list. Because... To most every person that I know in the higher echelons of certain evangelical cults, um, I'm unregenerate because I believe in a false god and a false gospel according to them. Um, but I think, you know, in our evangelism, we can very clearly state and warn people that if they have rejected the gospel, they are certainly not born of God. Um, and all parts of the gospel, all parts of the gospel. And we can, we can talk about that um, at another date. 
Okay, this question, what is your understanding of the covenants compared to the Presbyterians? Um, and I, I reworded this question. It was very long. Uh, and this is the one that I want to do on a podcast this week. I'm going to try to get Trey to come on with me, and we're going to talk this out, flesh this out a little bit to deal with some differences and some similarities. But let me say this about what we believe. And the original question, it was left over from last week, said this, you know, what do you believe as far as covenant theology, and how does it differ from the Presbyterian perspective, I think is what it said. Uh, we believe that there is one covenant, and it is the covenant of redemption, and that it is shown and revealed through other temporal covenant pictures throughout the, the, the narrative of Scripture. But there is on, only one covenant, and this covenant is God's covenant with the Son, God the Father, the covenant with the Son to redeem a people for Himself, and all the conditions of that covenant are met in the person and the work of Jesus Christ alone, so that God is the just and the justifier of all who have faith in Jesus Christ. There was never an opportunity for anyone to ever have life for, through obedience. Even Adam was not promised life. He was just promised death when he disobeyed. God did not establish a covenant with Adam that if he obeyed, he would live, but he surely did from the negative uh, that he would die. And his intention was to die, and God's purpose, I'm a superlapsarian, is that, that, that Adam would fall because God's purpose in creating the world and everything in it is that he would be the redeemer of his people and that through Jesus Christ the Son, he would save them from their sins. I know I'm talking very fast, but we're down at the half hour mark, and I really want to get to uh, a couple of these other questions. So the, pre the, 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 the covenants then are displayed in several ordinances. Well, <laughs> two ordinances, the baptism and the Lord's table. Uh, and so we as Baptists, we think differently about that covenant than our Presbyterian brothers and sisters uh, in, in some circles. And that doesn't mean all Presbyterians. It doesn't mean all Baptists. We're just using these labels as, as they're pertinent for our conversation. So don't, don't hear what I'm not saying and say, oh, James thinks all Presbyterians and all Baptists are brothers. No, but if they believe the true gospel, they most certainly are until they reject it. Uh, so... In that, then, Baptists believe that the covenant of baptism or that the covenant of redemption is depicted in the covenant of baptism as we identify with Christ's death, which is judgment, just like the flood, which is judgment, just like the drowning of the um, Egyptian army, which is judgment. So it is a picture that we identify with the death of Christ, and then the coming out of the water is identification with the resurrection of Christ to be walking in newness of life through this covenant of redemption that God does by grace alone, and it is, a, it is only received by faith. We just believe. Uh, the Presbyterians would look at it in a covenant community aspect. And I'm not Presbyterian, and though I read a lot about it and talked to a lot of them, I've, I've yet to really get a good overview of what they believe. But the, we would differ in that. They would baptize in the context of covenant life, or we baptize in the context of redemptive life. Um, and the same thing with the Lord's table, etc. cetera. Uh, and then those things flesh out in a lot of different ways. And if we start digging into covenant theology in depth, which I'd like to do on a podcast this week, uh, we could spend literally two hours, and we might give two hours to it. We might do two, we might do two podcasts on that. I can't remember who asked that question, but it is, um, it is a very good question. All right, this question here. Uh, I don't know if you, I don't know if you pronounce your name Jay or Jay or, uh, but I'll call you Jay. Uh, can you consider the church who says that drinking alcohol and smoking is a sin is legalistic? Absolutely, uh, and I want to say that with caveat. I don't want to be judgmental <laughs> um, because it may not say. I would say that you could consider, but I don't want to say that every church that says that are legalistic because. They would only be legalistic, Jay, if they came to the place of saying, if you don't smoke, then you are more righteous than if you do smoke. Uh, or if you don't drink, then you're more righteous if you do drink. But let me tell you why it's legalistic apart from that. Maybe they wouldn't say that, but it's legalistic apart from that because it adds a law to the to the, to the uh, life of the believer and then the life of the church as believers together. It adds an undue burden for them to abstain from something that the Bible has not said that they must abstain from. And I've heard every argument. Now, you're talking to a man who's never had an alcoholic beverage in his life. I mean, I've tasted some wine here or there. I've tasted some champagne through the years, but I'm 40, about to be 45 years old, and I've never consumed an alcoholic beverage, never cared to, and I used to think it was the most vile thing that could ever do happen in the life of a believer. I mean, you could look at adult material, and the only thing that would send you to hell faster is drinking some alcohol. So, But I've come to understand that that's not true. 
And so I, I can engage with others and, and, you know, enjoy fellowship with people who drink. However, drunkenness is very much a sin. So I'm, I'm from a perspective when I say these things, I don't imbibe myself, but I do not bring judgment on those who do. And I think that I've heard arguments of saying, well, it's a bad testimony. It's not a bad testimony to drink alcohol. As a matter of fact, if you've got Christians in a community, the only people that you should be concerned with seeing your testimony are the believers of a community. And if we've got weak believers who believe that, that you're wicked because you are drinking a glass of wine or a beer um, or smoking a pipe or a cigar or a cigarette, then then you've got you've got a bigger problem on your hands if you abstain from those things for the sake of a quote weaker brother, but you're not teaching that brother that he's weak. You're doing a d- disservice to him and an injustice to him, and you are calling evil what God has said is good. So we go there. Now, we're not going to get into the abuse of these issues. Of course, the abuse of a hamburger is sin. Abuse of of sweets and, 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 and cake are sin. Uh, back when I used to pound down a dozen Krispy Kreme hot donuts before the car left the driveway was sin uh, because it was a terrible thing for me to do. So that was how we should really approach that. And I think we should be careful. Ask questions if you're in a church who prohibits it as to why. A lot of time they do so because it's an issue of testimony. And I'm not going to say that that's not a wise thing. And it doesn't mean that you can't be a part of that church or say that they're legalistic if they're just trying to keep a good reputation. But I do think that you should always have the liberty inside the fellowship of the church to bring up issues that are semi-legalistic or semi-wrong or semi-heretical or even flat out in error. We should have the privilege to bring before the elders and before the church these issues, especially these social issues, because if we can't talk about them as the church, then we should. what good do we have? Um, what good are we doing in the context of the world? I mean, not the world, but what good are we doing as we live in this world not being of the world? So, And that might have all run together and not made any sense, but there we go. Let's see. Yeah, I know your mama. There we go. If you are a pastor of a 501c3 church and are not allowed to speak of certain things, I believe it's not a sin to have a drink, and it's, uh, it is a sin to be drunk in the court of the Bible. Absolutely, Elizabeth. Um, and and, um, and I'm not sure. I know you're not making a question there, but I'll bring that up. You know, if if you as a congregation are a 501c3, and that's a legal, that's a legal identification for certain nonprofits, um, there are things that you can and cannot do. Uh, and however, you know, if any of you want to talk about how we've structured, you have to have a corporate entity because you can't own real estate, commercial real estate. You can't rent commercial real estate. You can't have utilities in a commercial real estate without an LLC or an Inc. You have to have those things uh, because, you know, Georgia Power and Georgia, they're not going to open up a commercial building for James. It must be a business entity. So we have an entity that manages just those legal issues, but our church is a body, is a people, and our corporate documents distinguish those, and they can never be blended. So we've we've done due diligence in trying to make sure that we have what we need to have lights in a place, and you know, internet access and a telephone. But at the same time, we it does not infringe upon our ability to speak and do things on that nature. People don't give. Um, to get discounts anyway. So if we lost those things as churches, who cares? Uh, let's just let's just do what we need to do. That's a good point. Yes, eating a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts cannot be a sin. It cannot, it cannot. How about a half a dozen? Actually, if you eat 11, it's not a sin. If you eat 13, a baker's dozen, it's not a sin. But if you eat a dozen, it's a sin. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Um, when you evangelize, do you tell everyone the word... Uh, excuse me, that should say the work of, of Christ. Do you tell everyone that the work of Jesus on the cross was for them? Uh, no, I don't. As a matter of fact, it may not have been for them. Uh, the, Jesus did not die for every single person without exception. Jesus did not pay for the sins of all human beings, past, present, and future. Um, that's an extremely poor understanding of the work of the cross of Christ and the redemption that comes in Christ. That's called universalism. And this is not an opinion of mine. This is an opinion of, of, of Paul's and, and others uh, and Jesus himself. I know that's redundant. Sorry, grammar Nazis. Um, oh, probably shouldn't have said that. Sorry, grammar Uh, You know, we. I'm an older guy. I'm not a millennial, so I don't really know what is right and wrong to say sometimes. And I apologize for that statement. Um, you know, we, we, don't have, we don't have this universal thing. Jesus says, broad is the path. Jesus tells the Pharisees, you cannot bear my word. You cannot believe, for it has been prohibited for you to believe. Your eyes have been blinded. Your heart has been dull. Your ears have been dulled. Your heart has been hardened. You can't see. You can't believe. Um, 
there are a lot of people who can't believe because God hasn't opened their eyes. And if God doesn't open their eyes by the Holy Spirit, they will not believe. And if they die in their sins, it is then that we understand that Christ did not atone for their sins on the cross. Um, this is tough. Um, th this is where... <laughs> This is, this is where people really start to burn me against the wall because they don't want to hear the reality of what Scripture teaches in context, but they want to hold on to the talking points of evangelicalism and contemporary doctrinal positions of Christendom from the 19th century up. These things were not really prevalent in the holistic view of justification and the cross work of Christ. I can't go out in the world and say, Jesus died on the cross and paid for your sins. No, I can say Jesus died on the cross to save his people from their sins. I can say that Jesus died on the cross, and I can read the Scripture and tell them what, Je what Paul said to the church in Romans 3. I can go and do what the apostles did in Acts chapter 2 and preach the work of Christ, that he came to earth. He is God. He died. He lived a perfect life. He died. He was crucified. He was buried. He was raised from the dead. And the work that he did on the cross atoned for the sins of his people. And that only those who believe in the work of Jesus will have forgiveness and eternal life, etc., 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 etc. But to personalize it. See, what we've done is we personalize the evangel in error when we say that everyone so but when i'm talking to the church when i'm teaching the church i can say that you and your sins have been paid for on the cross you who profess christ your sins have been paid for on the cross jesus suffered for you and in your place on the cross jesus obeyed in your place in his life and jesus died in your place and jesus rose again for the sake of your security and your eternal perseverance so that's 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 how we do that. That that would be a really good time to to go through all these things and and, and talk about that in the context of evangelism uh, over several hours. Uh, this this is a good question. Um, believers have been granted a spiritual gift. How do we best encourage others to discern and use their gifts? Um, first, I'll say that you know First Corinthians chapter twelve uh, deals with spiritual gifts and. Um, it talks about all the different types of giftedness and that we're all one body. And, for example, imagine, you know, if all of a sudden my left eye and right ear fell off and half my hair fell off and three of my fingers on this hand fell off and then, you know, my leg fell off. I would not be a complete body. I couldn't function. I wouldn't be able to finish this podcast. Uh, and there'd be some really... We'd have to have some counsel here. There'd be some people that would be very disturbed, and I'm sorry. But, you know, the same thing is true in the context of the church. God establishes the church as He sees fit for the sake of itself that we might grow and mature and minister to one another. The problem is, is that we've come to administrate the spiritual gifts in Christendom as some kind of um, inventory that we can take a test and see who we are and what spiritual gift we had. The spiritual gift and to discern what God's done in our giftedness is centered around our personality. It's centered around our interests. It's centered around how we relate to people. It's centered around a lot of things. But most of all, our spiritual gift is how we can relate to each other in the context of helping each other grow in the Scripture and deal with life as it comes along through the Scripture because of what God has done through the Gospel. And I think that we need to be careful labeling someone to say, oh, you've got the gift of administration, or you've got the gift of mercy, or you've got the, because they don't, that's not necessarily true. Can you be merciful? Then be merciful. Can you help people around the office? Then help people around the office. Can you work with people? Can you counsel? Then counsel. Let's stop trying to say that they, we all have multiple gifts. We all have stronger gifts. And in my life, I used to be an extremely powerful administrator in that context, you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's and correcting everything. And there was a season in my life where that stuff went out the window. I wanted to study the scripture and I wanted to teach the word of God. And, and I didn't care if the pencil shavings were, were cleaned up or if anything else took place. I wanted to help feed God's people the word of God. And all that other stuff got in the way. So it was no longer something that I liked. It's no longer something that I enjoyed. And so I think that the best way to encourage others and to discern our spiritual gifts is to live life together as the body, 
under the teaching of the Word and continually to stay head down in prayer and in the Word, and God will give us opportunity to minister to each other. Sometimes that's going to be different every opportunity that we have, but, you know, there are some things that we just do and we're known for. Um, you know, people have always said to me, well, you're a musician. You need to use that spiritual gift. And I'm not using that spiritual gift in the context of, of the church because I would have to stop using the spiritual gift of prophecy, which is teaching the Scripture. Um, I know that that's something that God's gifted me to do, not because I'm good at it. It's just because I love to teach the Scripture, and God has given me a heart to learn and understand and then to explain, which is why I do this, to whoever wants to hear it and whoever wants to grow and learn the Word of God. So um, it's a really good question. I wish I could spend more time on that. Oh, goodness. Uh Oh, Taylor, let me let me let me speak to this question for a second, and then I've got my final question of the night. It's going to take me a little bit. Can you speak some on believer marriage to an unbeliever as by choice, not after being married? And the Bible is briefly discussed by Paul in First Corinthians seven. Um, is this you know, is this all we are given? Oh, in the context of that, First Corinthians seven. Well, I think that there is a. Um, let me turn to 1 Corinthians 7 and show Paul deals with divorce there as well. What's happening is that there is a lot of people in Corinth who were, they didn't actually have marriage in, in, in Corinth, but they had these they had these civil unions that were just sort of understood. Both men and women were property owners. Men were the uh, business owners. Women owned the buildings and the houses where these things took place sometimes, I've read. And so they had this mutual identity of, of, of property and et cetera, and marriage was sort of the same thing. We've come to agree that we're going to be together, and we're going to have children, we're going to raise a family. And what was happening is when, when somebody was coming to the faith and God was regenerating one and not the other, there was strife there. And Paul is telling the Corinthians, don't, the believer, don't divorce your spouse. But if they leave you, let them go. And, but if they want to stay, you let them stay, even if it's going to be, even if it's going to be tough. Um, And then there's some other implications there. But I, but I think the better, the, the better thing to understand is that the anxiety and the stress that comes from being unequally yoked, the illustration there, what good does light have with darkness and darkness with light? It doesn't coexist. Um, it is an uphill battle in marriage anyway. Anyway, I've been married almost 24 years now, and, and you know, it's, um, it's tough. It's very tough at certain seasons. I would hate to know that I was an unbeliever or my wife was an unbeliever and we were just at odds in the faith because what that would do is it would prohibit us from really being fulfilled in our ministry to the church and to each other and to our family. What do you do? I've, I mean, I've counseled people who have come to faith after being part of a cult and one spouse is stuck in the cult and now they're fighting over what they're going to teach the kids, the truth of Christ or the cult teachings. Um, and uh, let me let me dig some in that and look at some more holistic things, Taylor. If you'd send me a message, I'd appreciate it so that I would remember. Uh, but I'll I'll go back and love that comment. I really want to get to this final question uh, because uh, I'm not going to be able to do it justice here. But I want to be able to get it out because I think some people are waiting on it. And if they're not, <laughs> oh well. Um, but this this is a paraphrase. It's a little bit of a truncation. Um, of the original version. Some ministries that appear solid expose themselves in word and deed, revealing that they are more interested in personal kingdoms than the kingdom of Christ and Christian unity. So, in other words, you, there are some ministries, some ministries out there. And see, I really want to talk about what a ministry is. But there's some ministries out there that seem to be solid, but after a while, we start seeing that they're really just self promoting. I think that's what they're saying. They don't care about unity. Or the kingdom of Christ as a whole, they just want to be. They want to be the person that's known for everything, etc. I think that's what's being said here. And the question is twofold: Should we expose these ministries to all believers, to the believers that we have access to, publicly? And is it is is it our responsibility to do so? Let me say this: God has ordained one instrument, one instrument through which the teaching of the Scripture is to be done, and that is through the priesthood of the believer, the exposition, not the exposition, but the, 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 the gospel expansion is through the priesthood of the believer. We as the body of Christ, as we gather together as the gathered ones, the gathering, the church, and church doesn't mean that really, uh, the word church, ecclesia does, um, we are to continually advance the gospel 
through teaching people and discipling them in the Word of God. So there's the priesthood of the believer. In the confines of the local assembly, we see the teaching is reserved for the men of the church and then under the oversight of the elders so that we teach the church. When it comes to things that are more interested in personal kingdoms and the kingdom of Christ and Christian unity, um, we have to be very careful because that particular phrase is something that cannot be proven in any evidentiary way unless that person says, I'm more interested in myself and my kingdom and my ministry and my reputation than I am the gospel or Christian unity. So that is an inference that I would say is possibly and could very well be a misunderstanding. Um, it could very well be true as well. But we can't say that because it would be bearing false witness because it may or may not be true. Let's be honest. We who have a parachurch ministry, and those aren't real ministries that don't kill me, they're not real ministries. This ministry is effectual, Theology on Call, only as far as it does not impose or, di- or, di- or reduce from the teaching ministry of the local assembly known as Grace Truth Church. And many of Grace Truth are with us, and it is the encouragement by the body of Christ that I shepherd to do this because we are very spread out. And because now we do this publicly and live, a lot of you now have become sort of like surrogate uh, 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 siblings of ours, and we are very excited about it. And we love you all, and we pray for you all by name, um, and are happy to interact. But you know, if something comes along and we have to not do something, this ministry goes away, but my teaching ministry to the church does not. And the same thing is true with para church ministries apologetic ministries, polemical ministries, uh, evangelism ministries. These are supposed to be under the purview and oversight of the local church who is overseen by pastor elders. And when we have these issues where there needs to be some correction, the only the only ordained option that the Bible gives for the correction of any person in a public way is that the church in which they belong, bring them under public discipline. If I say from this particular broadcast screen right here, um, let me think of something. Uh, You know, Matthew Wordington. Hopefully there's nobody listening named Matthew Wordington. Well, let's just say Matthew Wordington is a heretic because he believes such and such and he believes such and such. And uh, I know none of you have heard of Matthew Wordington, but... Matthew Wordington is a devil in disguise, and he should be burned at the uh, proverbial stake of evangelical purity. Um, Guess what's just happened? I have not preached anything effectually good for you, but now all of you are Googling, and some of you are probably looking, all of you are Googling Matthew Wordington, and now you're on the bandwagon, and the Bible and the glory of God has been usurped. But let's take it more into line with this. Let's just say that in a personal way, um, some of you got into an altercation with me and I said some things that are not true or I said some things that are off color or by the Lord, oh gosh, the Lord have mercy, that I, that I actually cursed at you or something in anger. You should come to my elders and you should cause that to be corrected. You shouldn't go on Facebook and take your platform and begin to smear me based on a personal sin against you. That should never happen. There's no no teaching of Scripture that teaches that anybody outside the elders of the local assembly and to the local assembly have any authority to call out, mark, name, proclaim, or establish any type of public um, expose of brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, people answer that. Well, they're not brothers and sisters in Christ. How do you know? Do they not profess a gospel that is the right gospel? And do you not have sin in your life that you would hate to know was exposed? How about the sins of our mind, the things that we say, the things that we think, the the self-pride that comes when we get that post out, the self-pride that comes when we put that tweet out, the self-pride that comes when we put that, that new article out and we get a 1,000 views and the 600 likes and 50 people arguing about it. All the while, the sheep are not being fed. The church is being defamed. The name of our Savior is being dragged through the mud. 
I'm serious about this. Some of the things that I see on social media, some of the things I see on Twitter, some of the things that I see in blogs and even videos, and God help if I do it, call me out. People have called me out on this broadcast in the last four or five months, and I've been appreciative of it. But you know what they didn't do? They didn't put it and tag me over there in another post someplace and let me find it by proxy. They told me to my face, and I came back and I said, I'm sorry, and I want to fix it. And if I hadn't have... You can go to gracetruth.org and you can look at the number and you can contact any elder. And many of you even know many members of our church. Some of you are members of our church and you can call each other and you can get me on the table and bring me into uh, correction. And if I refuse it, then there might be a statement, that a, a statement that needs to be made due to sin and unrepentant attitudes and an unwillingness to be corrected. Pastor Tippins is off the air for a season. And everybody wants to know all the dirty details. Well, according to Peter, they're just murderous gossips because they want to know the dirty details. You know what's not important in the context of our sin? What it is and how deep it goes and who said what and she said this and everything else in between. What matters is is that we seek reconciliation and that we seek it with great humility because God has reconciled us through Jesus Christ, His Son, by nailing the hostility of our guilt and evil to the body of Jesus, and he nailed it to the cross. And when Jesus' body was broken and when his blood was spilled, he paid for the sins of his people, and there's no condemnation for those who are in him. But when we hold each other up to contempt and we don't take, take, and we take lightly the reality of exposure because it fits the culture we live in, we should be extremely shameful. And my call to my brothers and sisters in arms who proclaim the gospel is that we start letting people know what's happening inside our local assembly, that we would pray that God would cause us to weep over those who are at odds with us as Jesus has commanded us to do so and pray for our enemies. And friends, if there's a heretic out there on the loose, let him go. It doesn't matter. Take that 45 minutes that you'll spend this week dealing with trying to expose a heretic and take half of that and pray and be quiet and the other half of that to expose what God has revealed to you in your prayer and quiet time and you will be a blessing to the body of Christ. Otherwise, you're no blessing at all. i got much more to say about this issue, but I think I'm out of time. I love you all, and I thank you all for spending your Sunday nights with me. We miss some folks that are usually here, but if you know someone who might be interested in what I've had to say uh, or if there might be a question that we've answered that might help someone else, please send them this video. If you have personally something that you'd like to ask that you don't want live, please message me on Facebook or go to gracetruth.org or anchoringfaith.org, and we can communicate via email or maybe even set up a time to talk. I love you all. Lord bless and have a great evening.